So I came across this wonderful video from Praga University, which it's a university. I'm sure these people are really going to educate me on carbon dioxide. What are two of the dirtiest words in the English language? No, no, not the dirtiest words in the English language. You'll get me banned. Well, if you're concerned with global warming, as so many people are these days, the answer is obvious. The two words are carbon dioxide. Oh, isn't that sweet? The guy from Greenpeace is going to teach me about atmospheric chemistry. Let's get clear on our terms. It has become common to refer to the emissions from burning fossil fuels for energy as carbon emissions. That is entirely misleading. Actually, it seems a pretty sensible way of doing it to me. And uh, if you're actually talking about emissions from a coal-burning power station or something, you've taken the carbon from that coal and you put it into the atmosphere. You know, they're sort of carbon emissions. And guess what? Virtually all of the fossil fuels are almost entirely carbon by weight. Now, technically, the carbon dioxide emissions would be about three times the weight of the carbon because a carbon dioxide molecule weighs about 44 atomic mass units and only 12 of those are carbon. So about one third of the carbon dioxide molecule is actually carbon. So if you wanted to express these in mass forms, you have about three times the mass emission of carbon dioxide as you would of carbon. But I mean, chemists understand all of this, right? If we want to talk about the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we'll talk about that. Carbon dioxide is not carbon. Carbon dioxide is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas, which is an indispensable food for all living things. Oh boy. And this is why you might not want to trust the co-founder of Greenpeace giving his wonderful scientific facts from Praga University. So, carbon dioxide, according to him, is a colorless, tasteless, odorless gas. Carbon dioxide is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas. And at this point, I'm going to take a wild guess and speculate that this guy has never seen carbon dioxide in his life. Anyone who's cracked open a soda bottle and sniffed it will notice there's this sort of sharp acid smell. Hey, I've got a better idea. I've actually got a bottle of carbon dioxide. Okay, so there we have a carbon dioxide cylinder. So let's crack it open. And there we go. Let me see. There's carbon dioxide. And then we just open it up. And this one. There we go. And yeah, it tastes acidic and. Oh! Bloody hell! Yeah, right? Colourless, yes. Tasteless, no. Odourless. I've been a little more cautious this time. Oh, yeah, it, it basically smells like soda, but it's really powerful. So, <laughs> colorless, tasteless, odorless gas, my ass. Now, bizarrely, Wiki, which is usually pretty good for this sort of thing, has a rather odd entry for carbon dioxide where it says that it's a colorless, odorless gas, so it doesn't go for tasteless, it acknowledges it tastes, but even Wiki says that it's an odorless gas. Tastes acidic and, oh, bloody hell, yeah, right? And I'm a little skeptical about that. Which is an indispensable food for all living things. No, carbon dioxide is not a source of food for all living things. Plants, maybe. But for humans, it cannot be used as a food source. For us, it's something that we excrete. And if you're left in an atmosphere with a high carbon dioxide concentration, it's actually pretty toxic. If we pump much more of it into the atmosphere, the argument goes, we're going to alter the climate. Uh, yes, yes, you will alter the climate because if you change the amount of energy being absorbed by the Earth compared to how much it's radiating, then inevitably the earth will heat up. Think of an example like a kettle. When a kettle's just sat on the kitchen counter, it's not doing anything, right? Because it's absorbing the same amount of energy from the environment as it's radiating away. However, if you turn the kettle on and you add more energy to the system than it's radiating away, then the kettle heats up. That simple 
thermodynamics. It's exactly the same with the Earth. The argument goes, we're going to alter the climate, catastrophically. Well, having already worked out that Earth is going to heat up, and having measured that it's actually heating up, you do have to consider what the consequences of this are likely to be. And the most significant one is the change in the water patterns. We live in a time of plenty, so we've come kind of blind to famines. However, if you can't get enough water to grow the crops, that's what you're looking at. Now, a hotter Earth will have different water patterns. They will be more erratic, which is not beneficial for a stable food supply. I mean, just take, for example, if the snowpack doesn't form as well on the big mountain ranges as it does at present. Those who rely on that to melt and give them water during the rest of the year are going to be in real trouble. Sure, people will survive. However, the environment will not exist as it does today. Lots of species will become extinct as the environment changes. Some of those won't really make that much difference, like the polar bears. Others may have a very significant impact on our ability to grow food. It's always difficult to tell with such complex things as ecosystems. And this is all due to us burning fossil fuels. If we don't save ourselves from ourselves, we're toast. That's the claim. Well, reality check time. There is actually a problem that will cause a widespread consequences. I think it's kind of sensible to address that problem rather than pretending that it doesn't exist. Here's what's strange though. All life is carbon based. And the carbon for all that life originates from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yes, and things like this are basically the carbon cycle that they teach in high school. Unfortunately, there is now more carbon being emitted by mankind burning fossil fuels than there is being absorbed by the trees, resulting in an increase in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere resulting in more heat being absorbed by the Earth than radiated into space. And a few back-of-the-envelope calculations will show that the extra amount of energy being absorbed by the Earth because of these man-made activities is equal to detonating about one 10 megaton hydrogen bomb in the atmosphere every five minutes. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, four hundreds or thousands of years to come until that carbon dioxide comes out of the atmosphere. In other words, fossil fuels are 100% organic and were produced with solar energy. Sounds positively green. No, you sound positively moronic. It wouldn't make one jot of difference if they were made from pixie dust from child's lost wishes. The bottom line is they are increasing the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which results in the Earth receiving more energy from the sun than it's radiating into space. If there were no carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, the Earth would be a dead planet, period. Talk about catastrophic climate change. So what, the argument here is that because if there wasn't any carbon on Earth and therefore no carbon dioxide, there wouldn't be life on Earth. Well, I hate to break it to you, but there's actually quite a lot of carbon on Mars. In fact, Mars has a 95% carbon dioxide atmosphere. And the same with Venus. Venus has a massive, thick, dense carbon dioxide atmosphere, which gives it a colossal amount of global warming, resulting in a surface temperature of about 400 degrees Celsius. We should celebrate CO2 as the giver of life that it is. I'm Patrick Moore, co-founder of Greenpeace for Prager University. Somehow, having all that carbon dioxide in their atmosphere didn't turn them into an Eden-like oasis. I think the mix for life might be a finer balance than having lots of carbon dioxide or having none of it. Talk about catastrophic climate change. Take away CO2 and you'd have it. And yet the US Environmental Protection Agency has deemed this essential ingredient for life a pollutant. Oh my God, you numpty. Look, 
the EPA also has rules and regulations for copper in water. Now, if I was being the same sort of moron that you are, I would say, but copper is a naturally occurring element, and there wouldn't be life as we know it without copper. In fact, copper is essential for human life. So how can the EPA possibly brand something that it is essential for human life as a pollutant? But how can something that makes life possible be bad? Yeah, just because there is a natural amount that's actually fairly beneficial, that doesn't mean that dumping more of it into the atmosphere or more of it into the environment is actually a good thing, which is why we call them pollutants. The optimum level of CO2 for plant growth, for example, is four to five times what is currently found in our atmosphere. That's why greenhouse growers worldwide actually inject additional CO2 into their greenhouses. Well, yeah, kinda. But carbon dioxide is not the only thing that plants need to grow. Because otherwise they might grow very well on Venus or Mars. Higher CO2 levels in the global atmosphere will boost food and forest productivity. That will come in handy since by mid-century, we will have to feed 8 to 10 billion people. Yeah, but you actually just want more than plants growing better in general on Earth. What we're interested in is a stable food supply. For that, you primarily need a stable water supply. And I don't know whether you've been keeping up with America recently, but that's been kind of erratic of late. And secondly, of course, yes, it's true that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has led to enhanced plant growth on Earth. But you also have to bear in mind that that's been operationally insignificant as a factor of pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, with the majority of the carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere actually just dissolving in the oceans. That is, the carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere is going to be there for a very very long time. It turns out that carbon dioxide are not dirty words after all. Can you have too much of it? In theory, yes. That's what climate alarmists say is happening now. Dude, this is being alarmist. We know how much carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. We can see it there. We can see it in the change in the isotopic concentration of the carbon in the atmosphere. We can actually measure the warming. We can do the very simple calculations to work out the extra energy that that will gain from the sun. And it's measured in megatons of thermonuclear bombs per hour. This isn't being alarmist. These are just the facts. And it's going to be heating at that rate for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. These are just the facts.